Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Gabriel. And thanks to the Dominicans for being here. Um, as the title indicates, um, I have three subjects that I want to cover briefly. Uh, the function of money, the relationship between state and money, and international politics and uh, money. So we begin with the subject of money. Uh, what is the function of money? Why do we hold money? Uh, it is easy to explain why we have consumer goods, we consume them. Uh, it's also easy to explain why we have producer goods, producer goods we use in order to produce consumer goods. Um, but why do we hold money uh, despite the fact that we do not consume money, nor do we transform money into something else that we can, then can uh, consume? And in brief, uh, the answer is because of the existence of uncertainty. Um, if the world would be perfectly certain in the sense that we could predict everything that we ever want to have in the future, that other people want to have in the future and so forth, no money would come into existence. We would perfectly do with just consumer goods and producer goods. But uncertainty is not knowing when we need what. Um, and the fact of uncertainty explains why people look out for specific goods which have the characteristic of being easily saleable, of being widely acceptable. And imagine you want to prepare yourself for contingencies that you cannot foresee. You can immediately realize that if you have a commodity that can be resold as easily as possible, as, as widely acceptable as possible, then you are perfectly prepared for these contingencies that, um, that might arise in, uh, in the course of time. Because whenever such a contingency arises, you just take your money, the most widely uh, acceptable uh, commodity, and sell this in order to satisfy whatever desire might arise, and you could not predict it before that it would, uh, that it would arise. Um, money, then, is the most widely accepted commodity. It is the means of ultimate uh, payment, and it is the best protection against subjectively felt uh, uncertainty. Um, and you can also imagine that there is a tendency uh, in the market um, as the division of labor expands and ultimately becomes worldwide uh, for a commodity to be selected by the market participants that is on the worldwide scale the most easily saleable commodity and the most widely accepted um, uh, commodity. This prepares you um, for, for future contingencies in the best conceivable uh, way. So there is a tendency in the market for the development of a one-world commodity money. And historically, that happened to be gold or silver. In any case, some commodity uh, with, this, with this characteristic. So we then continuously allocate and reallocate uh, all of our assets either in the form of money or in the form of consumer goods or producer goods or titles to consumer goods or titles to uh, producer goods. Um, and the way we allocate our assets into these three distinct uh, categories and reallocate it constantly uh, reflects, so to speak, among other things, a person's perceived uncertainty or a person's aversion against uncertainty. The more certain we are about our future, um, uh, to this extent that we perceive the future as uh, certain, uh, the less cash we would want to hold on, uh, on hand, uh, or the less liquidity uh, we, want to, uh, we want to hold, um, and be invested instead only in consumer goods and producer goods. On the other hand, the less uncertain we are about the future, uh, the more are we interested in increasing our cash balances or increasing the purchasing power per unit 
of money and going out of consumer goods and, um, and producer goods. So, so much about money. Now I come to the topic of uh, st the state and its relationship to money. Um, let me just define what a state is. The state is the ultimate arbiter in every case of conflict that arises, including conflicts involving the state itself. Um, now, if you hear this type of definition, uh, you immediately realize that this is a very unique type of institution. Just imagine that you get together with some friends and suggest that as a solution of social problems, um, in every case of conflict that I have with you, I will be the ultimate judge who is right and wrong, including also in cases of conflict that I start with you. Um, I'm pretty sure that if you just present this to your friends, they will immediately declare you uh, crazy or nuts or whatever it is. But nonetheless, uh, such an institution has come into existence. Um, we all know that if we have a conflict with the state that the state has actually caused, it is, it is agents of the state that then decide whether they were right in hitting you on the head uh, or they were not right. And you can predict, of course, what their decision by and large will be. An institution such as this took hundreds of years to develop out of a situation where you had many judges deciding and competing judges deciding who was right and wrong. It's a long historical uh, development and it would take far too long to explain how such a miraculous type of institution uh, could ever make it. Um, in any case, what you can predict, of course, is that if such an institution exists, and it does exist, then the consequence will be there will be continuous expropriation and exploitation of property owners. And the state, in its attempt uh, to enrich itself at the expense of other people, because it is always the ultimate judge in every case of conflict, um, the, the state has, of course, a particular interest in the expropriation of money for the very same reason that we also like to hold money, that is, money allows them to do whatever pleases them at whatever uh, uh, point in time um, they have certain, uh, certain desires. Um, so this is why all states are interested in taxation. Um, but you cannot tax people uh, to the hilt without seeing some repercussions. The repercussions are that people might not be as productive as they otherwise might be if you are continuously robbed of your monetary income. Um, so there is then an alternative source of income to the state besides taxes, and that is trying to uh, gain uh, control over the production of money itself. Um, and all states have essentially gone through three steps to secure control of, uh, of the supply of money. And the three steps are, first, you monopolize the minting, um, the minting of gold, the minting of silver. You are the only one that can do this. Um, this allows you, of course, to engage more easily in counterfeiting than it would be if there were competitors in the field who can point out, look, this guy is counterfeiting or reducing the gold content or the silver content. The second step that you have to take is you have to monopolize the production of money substitutes. Money substitutes are nothing else but titles to money, paper tickets, uh, certify you as the owner of a certain quantity of gold. So the next thing is monopolize uh, the production of money substitutes. If you do this, you can again enrich yourself by simply printing up more tickets than gold or silver is available. 
And the third and final step in this process is to cut the tie between the property titles and the property, to cut the tie between the money substitutes and the genuine money to which the title entitles, entitles you. And then we are on a complete fiat money standard. Then money can be literally produced out of, um, out of thin air. Um, and it's easy to see that, of course, states would then make massive use of this uh, uh, capability. If I would entitle you, you are the only one that can print paper money. Of course, you will print paper money and you will realize you have far more friends than you ever imagined before that you might ever have in your life. They all will come to you and want to be helped. Um, what is the result of this? The result of this is there is a permanent redistribution of income. Increasing the supply of money cannot make society as a whole richer, but it can redistribute income within society. And the pattern of this redistribution is he who gets the money first will gain at the expense of those who get the money later. Uh, he who gets it first can buy, so to speak, at the old low prices, then prices are driven up. Those people who are on fixed incomes will see that their real income, their purchasing power has been diminished. That's the first, the first effect. The second effect is if this newly printed money is uh, channeled into the economy through the credit market, the interest rate will be lower than it otherwise would be. Um, it is lower despite the fact that people have not saved more, only because more money has been printed and people will then engage in investment projects that are unwarranted in light of the amount of genuine savings that has taken place and we cause, thereby we cause business, business cycles. This is the basic idea of the Austrian theory um, of the business cycle. And th the third effect is, of course, that we have um, ever rising government debts um, because we can monetize our debt. Uh, that is to say, uh, we can simply, in order to repay our debt, resort to the means of producing the money in order to repay, uh, to repay mm -hmm. our, uh, our debts. In addition, of course, um, because people um, are not considered to be the owner of government but democratic politicians, uh, they will long be out of power and not be held personally responsible for debts that they themselves uh, accumulated during the time when they uh, were in, in charge of, uh, of government. Um, and as a final result of uh, governments taking over the production of money um, and because states can legislate, again recall uh, in every case of conflict they decide uh, who is right and wrong and then they can change laws in any way they wish. Um, the level of uncertainty is actually uh, elevated to a new, uh, uh, to a new heights. Uh, they can create uncertainties that did not exist before. And what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that the demand for liquidity is actually increasing. Uh, that is, people are far more concerned in the presence of a state uh, to invest in resources on account of their liquidity than they would be if we would have a stable money such as uh, such as the gold, uh, the gold standard. Um, so now I come to international politics. Um, there exist, of course, many states, uh, and all of these states went essentially through the steps that I have outlined. Each has their own national paper currency issued by their uh, own uh, central bank uh, and uh, this causes a certain problem for states. 
Uh, if one state inflates its own paper currency continuously more than other states do, then your currency is bound to fall, the exchange rate of your currency is bound to fall against others. Um, with the consequence that if people anticipate that the currency of my country, so to speak, is continuously falling against the currency of others, uh, then they simply abandon the continuously falling currency and move into others. And that would, of course, take away this magnificent power that states have to enrich themselves by creating money out of, um, out of thin air. So this leads me to international politics. Uh, if we have many states in place, we should expect that we have uh, a heightened level of warlike activities going on. The reason is very elementary. Um, first, states are in the business of ripping off people, so they are, have no moral restraint to begin with. But as a state, you can also externalize the cost of aggression onto others. That is to say, you can make other people pay for your own aggressive impulses that you have. Uh, people have aggressive impulses more or less, but what restrains you sometimes to give in to your aggressive impulses is of course the fact that you have to pay for it. Um, you have to pay for the weapons, for the bodyguards, whatever is necessary in order to attack other people. Uh, if, however, you don't have to pay yourself uh, for aggressing against other people, but you can make other people, your subjects, pay for your aggressive ventures, then you tend to be more aggressive than you otherwise would be. Because of this, we have the tendency of states going to war against each other. Um, and this brings me to what I call the paradox of foreign, foreign policy. Um, who wins in wars and who loses in wars? Um, and the paradox is this. States that are internally oppressive have economies that tend to be weak. But in order to be successful in a war, you need a productive economy. You have to build the weapons. Uh, you have to have, have uh, domestic, the domestic citizens have to continue producing and so forth. Um, and uh, oppressive economies, oppressive states, do not have a flourishing economy. So they tend to be, uh, as far as foreign policy is concerned, uh, rather cautious because they know other things being the same in the long run, they will tend to lose. On the other hand, liberal states, liberal in the, in the European sense that they are comparatively nice to their population, have a functioning economy uh, and will tend, out, tend to win in drawn out, uh, in drawn out wars. Um, with the result that the most liberal countries will tend to be the main imperialist powers. Um, first example, of course, Great Britain, internally quite liberal, but of course it is the most powerful for many centuries, the most powerful imperial country, precisely because they have the means to defeat other countries. Um, and then, of course, uh, beginning uh, with the end of World War, uh, World War I and then even more pronounced after World War II, this role that was formerly played by Great Britain was taken over by the United States. Again, internally very liberal country, but because of this and the nature of states to be aggressive institutions to begin with, a tendency for America to become the foremost uh, imperialist, uh, imperialist country taking over other territories in order to milk the cows that graze on other territories um, as well. Um, but it is not necessary that you actually have to take over a country, another country, in order to exploit this other country. This is not to say that Great Britain and the United States did not also take over countries. You just simply look at 
all the number of troops that Americans have stationed at various countries. They are not there to protect the domestic population from whatever armed robberies or something like this. They are there, of course, to exert pressure on the governments in which they, they uh, are stationed. Imagine, for instance, there would be Spanish troops, German troops, Chinese troops, and so forth on American territory. What the American population would think about that, whether they are there for protecting them. Uh, or if they might have a slightly different function from what America claims their troops do in other, uh, in other countries. So the alternative to taking over countries is to engage in what one might call monetary uh, imperialism. And the best example of this is um, probably the former Bretton, Bretton Woods system uh, which collapsed in 1971. So how does it work? Normally, uh, a country has to um, finance its imports by its exports. Imports, after all, are goods that benefit me at home. Uh, exports are things that benefit other people. Uh, people don't give you handouts for free. You have to pay for your imports, and to pay for your imports is you export goods to those people from whom you um, imported, um, imported something. Um, but it is possible um, that you can avoid this paying for your imports by your exports if you have set up a system such as existed with Bretton Woods. Um, how did this system function? At that time, the United States still had the obligation to re redeem $35 for an ounce of gold to foreign central banks. Um, the um, United States government expanded its dollar supplies, paper, paper dollars, uh, and they persuaded the central banks of other countries, inferior countries, to inflate on top of uh, U.S. Dollar, uh, dollars that they re received in these, uh, in these countries, thereby holding the exchange rates between the currencies stable, more or less at least. Um, and German central banks, Spanish central banks, they would use their dollars that they received not to buy American goods, um, or not to uh, buy American real estate, but simply to invest this, these dollar amounts in government bonds issued by the United, uh, issued by the United States. Um, that is to say, um, we had what was called uh, trade deficits without tears. Um, the United States could run permanent trade deficits without actually having to pay for it in the form of genuine goods uh, flowing out of the United States or genuine goods in the United States being bought up by foreigners. Uh, so a system was set up where the American Central Bank exploits the domestic population and foreign populations as well. Um, now this, and of course, you can imagine at the, the, ultimate, the ultimate solution to the problems of states is to create a one world central bank, of course dominated by the United States, uh, and, uh, and then uh, issuing a one world paper currency where this process would, so to speak, work in the most smooth way that you can, um, that you can imagine. Um, so a sign of monetary imperialism is how many reserves or the amount of reserves that other countries hold in the form of, of, US, of US dollars. Um, as you know, this Bretton Woods system, system of course, uh, failed um, uh, because some bank runs did occur. Other central banks did present the United States with the flood of uh, 
paper dollars, wanting, uh, wanting to have them redeemed into, into gold, but the United States, of course, couldn't do it. Uh, so in 1971, the United States essentially declared bankruptcy. And the question is, why didn't, um, why didn't other countries do anything about it? And the answer is, of course, because it was the United States. Um, small bullies are small built bullies, and the United States is a big bully, and the small bullies were not capable of threatening the United States, the big bully, to just uh, yet uh, send all their gold reserve to, uh, to other countries. Since 1971, then, we have entered uh, a period in history like it has never existed before, uh, where absolutely no tie was left over to gold. The entire world was now on pure uh, fiat money, on a pure fiat money standard. Um, of course, initially, the idea was that from the point of view of the United States, that everything would just work as it did before. Um, instead of holding dollar reserves that would be somehow tied to gold, uh, other countries were simply supposed to hold dollar reserves that were tied to absolutely nothing except to the trust uh, in the trustworthiness of the United States, uh, of the United States government. Um, but with the elimination of the last tie to gold, uh, I would claim we can also see a gradual fall in the power of the United States. Um, as long as the United States was somehow tied to gold, um, the trust and the power of the United States, in the, the trust in the United States and the power of the United States was higher, and since that time, it has continuously uh, diminished. For a while, um, this, um, yeah, this loss of U.S. power um, was hidden by the fact that after the fall of communism, um, uh, all East Bloc countries uh, also began to demand increasingly dollars and add dollars to their own uh, to their own reserves, giving the impression that the strength of the United States uh, had not had not diminished. Many countries were actually dollarized. Uh, dollars were used in other countries as uh, uh, as a currency. Um, but this this new system, which existed since 1971. Um, was, of course, not a system uh, without, without crises. Uh, we did have recurrent bank runs, and we did have state bankruptcies, even though not in the center of the American empire, but at the fringes, at places like Argentina, various other uh, South American countries, and so forth. We had wildly fluctuating exchange rates, we also had hyperinflation in various countries. And with the most recent crisis, I think the problems have arisen so at the center of the empire rather um, than uh, at, the f at the fringes. So now we had bank runs in the United States. Um, and in response to the bank runs in the United States, we have massive new fiat and uh, fiat money creation and credit, uh, credit creation spreading from the center of the empire outward to, uh, to the periphery. Um, the dollar and the United States government are for the first time widely seen as genuinely vulnerable. And uh, correspondingly, the demand for dollars and uh, U.S. government bonds uh, has declined relative uh, to that of other major currencies such as the euro and uh, euro dominated uh, bonds and of course also relative to uh, to gold the dollar reserves of central of other central banks uh, the proportion of reserves that they hold in the form of dollars has continuously declined i think it was in the range of 80% and has declined to something like 60. Those are just ballpark, ballpark figures. Um, in addition, um, there has been a massive increase 
um, in, in the supply of dollars, uh, combined, of course, with a heightened awareness on the general public um, that total debt uh, accumulated by the United States government cannot possibly be financed, except, of course, at economic growth rates that are impossible given the burden that the United States government uh, is and has been on, uh, on the productive sector of, uh, of the United States. America would have to save so much more, uh, all the while their real incomes would continuously uh, fall. Um, they would have to pay so much more um, because far more goods would have to be exported to pay up for its imports, for the fact that America has lived for a long time at the expense of, uh, of other countries. Uh, so savings rates would have to drastically increase uh, despite falling real incomes that such a thing can be ruled out as being completely uh, unreal, unrealistic. Um, so this is simply not going to happen. What is going to happen, I'm afraid, will be uh, a sharply falling dollar um, and, of course, also sharply falling value of government, uh, U.S. government uh, bonds. Um, and we might have to anticipate the real possibility of uh, hyperinflation or the default of the United States government. I'm, and I'm afraid, of course, if they default on uh, paying their, uh, their bonds, that they will first default, of course, on, on foreigners. So especially foreigners owning U.S. government bonds uh, should be very careful if that is a wise, uh, uh, a wise investment. Um, of course, you can expect that now in this crisis situation, a last desperate attempt will be made um, to achieve this ultimate goal that I indicated before, that is creating some sort of world central bank with some domination by the United States in order to bail themselves once more out of this problem and only create uh, a scenario for an even bigger catastrophe coming, whatever, 10 years or 15, uh, 15 years uh, from, from now. But all of this, I'm afraid, will be uh, to no avail. Uh, it, it cannot prevent the ultimate collapse of the present monetary system. And again, recall, this system has only lasted for 40 years, um, and nothing like this has ever existed in, uh, in human history, and this system is not going to last uh, uh, for, much, for much longer. Um, and with this collapse that will eventually come either immediately or uh, in the not too distant uh, future, the only good thing um, that will come out of it will be the American empire will fall apart. Um, since America has dropped all ties to gold, it has become increasingly a paper tiger. Um, but unfortunately, we also have to be aware of the fact that uh, people who are very weak, uh, who have become a pap paper tiger, can also become very dangerous uh, and cause another crisis in order to, yeah, um, in, in order to um, pretend that they can rescue us out of this crisis um, and to cause another crisis that um, might. Uh, make people clamor for a new world central bank and so forth, uh, it is not unlikely that the United States will even expand its war activities uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. Who knows, after Iraq, uh, Iran will be the next, and if the United States doesn't do it directly, maybe they have Israel do it for them, and then once Israel starts this, the United States can, of course, not, not help them. Thank you.